Good afternoon, as you know, we had a very useful bilateral meeting with the Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard in Queenstown on the weekend. At the heart of our agenda was a package of measures to recognise the 30th anniversary of CER. Uh, CER is widely recognised as one of the most far-reaching and successful trade agreements. Uh, CER has been a key driver of competitiveness in Australia and New Zealand, contributing to our economic growth and creating jobs on both sides of the Tasman. And we're not standing still. One of the four economic measures we announced on the weekend was aimed at limiting how much New Zealand and Australian consumers pay to use their mobile phones in each other's countries. There is no reason for people to pay astronomical cell phone bills on returning from holiday on the other side of the Tasman. It's fair to say that a clear signal of government intentions, intentions is in this area has seen telecommunications companies get the message. Uh, costs for New Zealanders have dropped substantially since it was first mooted. Uh, the regulatory controls may be applied. Uh, my announcement on the weekend with Prime Minister Gillard makes it clear that we are serious about keeping these charges reasonable. Prime Minister Gillard and I also announced that our countries would contribute $3 million in matched funding uh, over the next two years to support the identification of a potential vaccine for rheumatic fever. In New Zealand, rheumatic uh, heart disease, which stems from rheumatic fever, kills about 150 people a year, and hospitalisation costs for rheumatic fever and heart disease are around about $12 million. It is a disease that particularly afflicts Māori and Pacific people, and both the Australian and New Zealand Chief Science Advisors have confidence we can make progress towards a vaccine. You'll also note that we announced that New Zealand's agreement to take 150 asylum seekers from the Australian system each year. New Zealand has long acknowledged that boat people are a regional problem. In other words, they are our problem as well as Australia's. I've said that before and I'll say it again, it's only a matter of time until we have mass arrival here in New Zealand. Australia is putting huge resources into stopping these boats, some of which have expressly stated they were en route to New Zealand. Australia's efforts are directly benefiting New Zealand. Let me also repeat that these 150 refugees from the Australian system are not in addition to the 750 uh, refugees we take from our current UNHCR quota, they are part of that quota. Uh, and they're not queue jumpers, they have to be genuine refugees assessed under the UNHCR criteria and will have spent as much time in the system as refugees who come from uh, other sources that we take people from. They gain no advantage, ultimately uh, we just determine who we take and who we don't. We cannot just turn back these boats once they're in our waters, they become our responsibilities under our current laws. That is why we need regional cooperation and why we must do our part to support the preventive work Australia is doing. We cannot bury our heads in the stand and hope for the best. The problem exists and we need to work together to work out how to resolve it. Uh, just in terms of ministerial activity, uh, this week I'm in the House tomorrow and Wednesday, Auckland on Thursday and Hamilton on Friday. In the House this week is, is the government's intention to continue the debate on the Prime Minister's statement and progress the Corrections Amendment Bill and the Privacy Information Sharing Bill. Dr the Right Honourable Lockwood Smith's valedictory speech will be on Wednesday at 5.30 and of course this week will be the start of the new speaker. You say that they're not queue jumpers, why is that? Uh, because of the no advantage rule uh, that operates, what effectively happens is um, an assessment is made of how long someone would likely be in a camp from one of the other sources that we take people from, Africa or Asia and the likes, and that's the same process that would apply if they are in Manus or PNG or in the Australian system. What is New Zealand doing this? Um, I mean, what's in it for us? Have you promised something from New Zealand? No, it's important to understand. I mean, you know, I wanted to do this, I think it's the right thing to do, but there's a few reasons why. Firstly, um, there's no cost to New Zealand, and in some sense there's no difference for New Zealand, in, in the sense that we could be reasonably ambivalent about where we take people. We're just taking 750 people a year, as long as they're genuine refugees, that's the first criteria. There is an advantage, though, I think, from New Zealand's point of view, that we're sourcing 150 of that 750 from the Australian system, and that is a... You can't turn these boats back that's, when we went through the extensive process of looking at potential law changes, all of which are, are sort of still on the cards, one thing the legal advice tells you is there's very little you, do, you can do. You can't stop these boats sailing into our water. Um, you, you, know, you can't take inhumane, and you, in New Zealand wouldn't take inhumane action. Um, so in the end, once a boat hits your water, you have to deal with that situation. So the best defence mechanism is stopping um, the, um, the, uh, disrupting the boats before they leave. So the Australians have huge amounts of resources dedicated towards that. It's been quite a successful effort. So we can piggyback on the back of that. We just don't have the resources dedicated to that. So that's the first thing. 
um, that I think um, makes a big difference. Um, secondly, you know, my view is that um, we are helping our, our mates, uh, and that's useful. Uh, but, but in return for that, we are not only getting that capacity uh, to have all of that information. Secondly, the Australians, uh, if they have a boat that turns up that's on route to New Zealand, will do everything they can to stop it. And that's why I don't know how much information was released on the Duma and, and other boats that looked to come to New Zealand. But there have been cases where the Australians um, have considered whether they would help shepherd a boat across the Tasman. People were absolutely adamant to do that. Well, again, you know, we can't, you know, we can't stop that. This helps that, that part of the process. The, yes, the coalition, the coalition has criticised this deal in Australia. If there's a change in government in Australia later in the year, do you think this deal will stick? Well, it's entirely up to them. If they don't want us to take people out of the Australian system, they're more than welcome to. But yeah, I'll be pretty, pretty, pretty comfortable in betting that there'll be no change. So people yeah. might say that New Zealand's essentially endorsing and legitimising the apparently falling conditions in these offshore detention centres. Well, for a start off, um, we've raised that issue with the Australian Prime Minister. She is extremely confident that the, the camps that are operating within the Australian system meet um, the world's standard for what is expected for a refugee camp. So they reject the proposition that these are not up to international standard. But they've been criticised by both the UNHCR and the Amnesty Well. That's the view of the Australian government is that they meet the international standard and that's the Does within the Australian, system, Australian, system, Australian system mean on Australian territory? Sorry. Does within the Australian system in that state mean in Australian territory? Or <laughs> Some of them are. In fact, the vast bulk are in the Australian territory because there's only limited numbers of PNG and Manus. Anyway, we're not starting until 2014 and people will like to be in those camps for a reasonable period of time. You mentioned that Australia might actually process any mass arrival in New Zealand that might be sent back, then you'll need legislation to do that. Yep. So um, are you going to approach other political parties to get that passed? If, if we decide to go there, so basically as part of the original, when we were looking at this proposal, one of the things I liked about the proposal was saying, okay, if we got a number of ships coming to New Zealand, how would we handle that? And at the moment, the obvious place is the Mangarei Detention Centre, but that's, that's not for, for you know, long-term issues because we're dealing with other refugees that are coming. So one of the ideas I had was, well, maybe we can actually use their offshore processing centres and that will act as the deterrent that some people argue it might for Australia. The legal advice I got was that that is not um, possible as the legislation currently stands in New Zealand. So we would need to change the legislation. So as part of this agreement, the Foreign Minister has been speaking to the Australian Foreign Minister, and I've certainly raised this issue with Julia Gillard, that we might want to go down that route. But if we did want to, A, we'd have to pass legislation, and B, we probably discussions with other parties. It's not something I'm planning to do today, um, but it's something we could do. So you and would, would think that for that? Yeah, they, they understand that. So, well, I'm afraid you're concerned that you may be sending a wrong signal to people traffickers and all of this? No, I mean, look, in the end, um, the what I think you, what you all have to accept is you've got desperate people doing desperate things when they get on these boats. And it's well documented that people are losing their lives um, and we can, you know, can identify the ones where there is a tragedy you know, close to Australian waters, uh, but there are probably many that lose their lives that we're just not aware of, uh, and they ha happen far out to sea. So you've got desperate people doing desperate things, and I don't think you're going to stop that easily, even with the offshore processing units and the likes. In the end, you've got to find a way of dealing with it. So Australia is taking, as I think I said, I think it's 20,000 refugees a year. We're taking 700. The vast bulk of what Australia is taking now will be through its own centres. So you would, you, when you just asked an Audrey's yeah. question before, Australia is receptive to possibly one day doing our offshore process? It is serious. Yeah. And so we would send, uh, if a boat did arrive, we would send them to Papua New Guinea or Nauru? Well, that's a possibility. And that's what's uh, on the table if we want to go and explore that. It would have to be driven by New Zealand to go and change our legislation and negotiate that potential with those parties. But yes, that's possible. So you'd be happy as Prime Minister to see these people um, processed up in those camps? Well, to be, to be perfectly honest, I'm not happy if a boat comes to New Zealand. I'm just reacting to the stream of advice that I constantly get. And yeah, I accept the view that some people hold that, you know, that's not likely or easy to come to New Zealand. But then that was exactly the same proposition that the Canadians used to talk about until the boat came up. So why don't, we, why don't we build our own detention centre and do it? Well, we, we are in the process of that publicly announced. We're in the process of, of spending a lot of money at Mangarei um, to upgrade it. But 
even then, that would be a very costly way of doing it. Now, we might have to do that in years to come if we decided not to embark on a change in legislation and we did see lots of boats coming to New Zealand, we'd have to work out how to deal with all that. And that was part of the process of review that was undertaken and part of the legislation that we were looking to introduce in the House. Fundamentally, to give ourselves a lot greater powers of how to deal with this. But what I can tell you is, in the end, when you know, push comes to a shove, there is very little you can do when there's boats out in the waters. Presumably, if we sent people to Australia, though, we'd have to pay for that. Yeah, but then these people would be landing on New Zealand shores. So you go back and say, OK, at the end of all of this deal, in 2014 or 2015 or 2016, New Zealand was going to receive 750 refugees. That number is the same. But by changing the mix of where we might take them, we've given ourselves much greater links into the intelligence that and ongoing support of those, that, those intelligence links in, in, uh, on the ground that Australia pay for. We've given ourselves um, an assurance that Australians won't be looking to shepherd people across the Tasman. And we've given ourselves a, a chance, if we want to, to use potentially offshore processing centres. So, so that's a pretty good deal. Why, what, when did Australia say to you that they were considering shepherding a boat across the Tasman? Well, there's a long-standing history of a boat that was looking to come, and that was potentially one of the options. Again, if people say, I will not get off the boat, you know, in the end, you can't force them off the boat. If they say, oh, I am going to go out there and sail across the Tasman, they can do that. But then, uh, you know, a first world country has to think about what that might mean if with all of that knowledge, that is happening before their eyes. And one option is, do you give them support? now? You know, I, I just think we have a much better position now we're part of a regional solution. Were they, yeah. were they threatened with all support or intelligence in any way? Uh, no, they, they, they certainly weren't trying to heavy us in any way, shape or form. I have been of the view that this is an issue that we need to deal with and I have been very strongly of the view that changing the mix of where we take people is a pretty small price to pay because there is no price because then we're going to take 750 people. But, what you can be sure of is we're likely to continue to get that very high level of information. And again, I mean, I can't publicly release a lot of information at the end of the IAA for obvious reasons, but what I can tell you is that I get more than enough um, correspondence from my intelligence agencies, fed from the Australian intelligence agencies, to tell you that this situation and the likelihood of a boat wanting to come to New Zealand is very real and very alive. And I was dealing with it just before I went on my Christmas holidays. But as you've just said, don't we, doesn't New Zealand already get a high level of information? So what's the difference going to be in terms of what we get as a quid pro quo? Continued, continued support. So I mean, in, in the so end, if we, if we just wash our hands of it and say, look, Australia, it's totally your problem. You deal with all the people, you take them all. Then, OK, but you, we can do that. And they'll probably continue to support us because it's a great relationship between New Zealand and Australia. <coughs> But there's lots of areas where we try and work together and where we take a regional approach. When it came to Ramsey, it was a regional approach. When it comes to rolling out education support in the Pacific, it's a regional approach. So you feel yeah. lots of things we work on them together. But can you no suggestion from the Australians that they would withdraw that support and we're not actually getting a higher level of support, then how is that an advantage to New Zealand? Because in the end, I think we've got to pull our weight. And I don't think it comes at a price to New Zealand, so why wouldn't we do it? Can you tell us more about what you're doing in uh, I don't know if we're publicly in this. I know the, I know the number and I know the deal. It's pretty major overall. You said when you introduced the Immigration Amendment Bill, you, you said that you weren't paying to, to fund the detention centre in Well, we're not. We've got Mangaray and we're going to revamp it. But are you it's expanding it? Or, I mean, no, you just upgrading it. It's just, it's just old and tired and things work. Well, Mr. When you say you were dealing with this just before Christmas, but the possibility of a boat coming here, did you have some indication that one was on its way? Yes. Well, it came again sourced by the Australian system, and they, as I understand it, either it fell over or they just had enough information to ensure that it didn't take place. But all I'm telling you is this stuff is real. I deal with it all the time, and at some point, someone's going to get a boat that's going to turn up. Now, even this deal doesn't fix that, but you know, it's, it's a hard place to get to. It's a long way away, but so is Canada. Yeah, because Billy Gillard at the, at the weekend, she did make mention of how hard it would be to, yep. to get here. She didn't seem to be as certain as you are uh, now that, that someone could get here. Well, I remember the Canadians saying they didn't think a boat would turn up. I mean, look, in the end, the vast bulk of the boats that turn up in, in 
the Australian system, a small craft that would really struggle to get to New Zealand, that's a statement of fact. But as every year has gone by, the people smugglers have got more sophisticated, the boats have become larger. So was this boat before Christmas um, on route to New Zealand? That was the plan. Was the plan was sort of the Where, what, what happened? Did it I don't know the details of why it fell over, but the deal was... How many people were on? Lots. Was it intercepted by the Australians or something? The information was here. Yeah. They intercepted this boat on the Well, the, the information that was going to take place here. Yeah. When you say lots, what time? Hundreds. So where did the boat end up? Don't know. Don't know whether, don't, don't know whether it, actually, it actually happened. And that's part of what we deal with. There are endless sort of plans that are hatched and information that we get and things that we do. But our first and best form of defence is dealing with it on the ground um, in, in these countries which are the embarkation point for the boats. And that's where Australia has a lot of resources and a lot of energy. And it's really useful for New Zealand to tap into that. So this is intelligence rather than an interception. Right? Correct. Yeah. So when you said the deal fell over, you say that it didn't actually leave? That there was well, I've any further advice that it's on its way, so I'm assuming it hasn't got off the ground or hasn't gone. Did you know where it was coming from? Yeah. Where, what, Indonesia? That would be a pretty good guess, yeah. So he's Indonesia. You, you suggested this morning that you Well, in so much that, uh, we can pick and choose in so much that they have to be genuine refugees. So this argument that somehow we might not get a genuine refugee, that doesn't fit. No, but once you've actually, you know, you have a pool of yeah, several thousand approved refugees, yeah. are you then going to pick and choose? No, I think we'll be happy. We'll be happy as long as they fit the criteria of being a genuine refugee. So if you have any or any other international organisations, any feedback or concern about the change and where we'll be taking We've been taking them through our thought process and what we intended to do long before we announced what we did in the weekend. And what was the response? Well, I mean, look, up in the end, you know, they understand we have our sovereign right to choose where we take refugees from. So they wouldn't have Well, I wouldn't put them in those terms and say that they understand, you know, what we're trying to do with it and maintaining the number of refugees we take, but instead of taking them from, you know, Asia and Africa, or take a small, small group from Australia. Why didn't you yeah. Uh, I noticed the absence of um, the voluntary project of uh, mutual recognition of yeah. tax credits. Have we given up on that one? No. Um, there's, a, there's something in the community I'm pretty sure that says there's ongoing work from the officials. I mean, I think what's fair to say is we push harder on that one than the Australians do. The fiscal implications for the Australian Treasury are much greater than ours. Um, there's a bit of debate within each system about uh, the, you know, the, the, the absolute accuracy of whether it would be a self-funding, as I think um, the Productivity Commission argued or the work was done by NZIER, I think. Um, but look, New Zealand's view is, if you really want to have a totally integrated Australasian market, then we've done that when it comes to trade, pretty much. We need to do it in terms of capital markets, and a really important part of that is information streaming and information credits. Um, what hope have you got of um, getting further immigration legislation through the, you know, to, to get the Australians to agree to processing? Um, because you haven't got well, that, that's subject to New Zealand passing it, so it's got nothing to do with the Australians. But in terms of if we wanted to change the legislation to use offshore processing, obviously it depends on where we'd want to send those people. So if it was PNG or Nauru or whatever, you'd have to go and talk to those particular countries. But yeah, in the end, we could potentially do that, yes. But would you have the numbers in the New Zealand Parliament to change the legislation? That I don't know. Well, wouldn't you check that first? It's quite a big step to make. No, because we're not planning to make that step today. We're just buying ourselves an option to do it if we want to. And did you consider when you took the 150 actually just adding it on to the existing 750 quota instead of incorporating it in it? No. I think we're comfortable <coughs> that 750 is about the right setting for New Zealand. We put a lot of resources into refugees that come into New Zealand. Um, so I think it's about making sure we give them as uh, good experience as we can. There's obviously family reunification that sits on top of that, so the actual physical number is always more. And it's really important that we can provide them the best support we can around housing and social services and, and the likes. And so I think that number's about right for New Zealand at the moment. And we'll do, do, do you sort of see the potential risk and the political risk in buying, in buying into Australia's detention model? No, I don't think so. Well, 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 I mean, but, but don't you see it as a detention model the way they're handling your refugees? No. Will there be any sort of secure area in the remap um, that's happening at Mangere? Well, I can't tell you the exact answer to that.
there. I mean, I, I don't think so. That's not the plan of what we're doing yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Right at the moment. What we're doing at the moment is a revamp of the existing facilities. So at, at the moment, if there was a mass arrival, you would detain them somewhere like an army camp? Well, there's a number of options, but Mangalai is obviously the, the primary option, depending on whether it had people in it or not. Um, but depends how big it was, and but yes, you know, an army facility technically, but that couldn't be forever, could it? Are you, and you haven't got legislation to actually do that. I mean, is that legislation actually going to pass? Well, I think so. I mean, we won't introduce unless we can get the numbers for it, but there's quite a pretty strong case, I think, for making the changes that we're proposing, and in the fullness of time, we'll work that through with other partners that might support us. Well, so that can you report back in August, and you haven't been ready to vote? Yeah, I know, but we've also had a lot of things that have been pressing. I mean, we ran out of time to actually get the alcohol law reform bill passed before Christmas, so it's all about what we think is the number one priority. So will you try and um, get this measure of Australian processing attached to the bill at the moment? I don't think so. I mean, my view would be we've got some optionality there, so the chance to do it if we want to. But I think my view would be we carry on with where we're going in the current um, bill, which is basically just giving ourselves better rights and, and sending some deterrent messages, uh, which was the aim of that legislation. How important is the Navy in this um, disruption and prevention and how concerned are you by um, the recent report that Australian sailors are needed for our frigate sail? Well, ultimately, if there was a, a mass arrival, um, then they would clearly would play a part. Um, am I concerned? Uh, no, look, I mean, in the end of the day, sometimes there are skill shortages and, and there's exchanges across the Tasman to fill those. You said that you're not planning at this stage um, to progress with the legislation to use the detention centres, but what events or, or what would change? I think we start seeing lots of boats. So you'll do it after an arrival rather than try and see if there's support for it? No, I think the legislation will probably pass at some point, hopefully prior to an arrival. Which, but which the, legislation this is is the, This is the, I mean, current. Right, yeah, the current legislation that's on the books. But any other amendment, we, we, we can probably do it at a later time. We'll, we'll on another an issue. Arrival. Oh, I would so. On, we on, on issue. another issue, Prime Minister, the. Um, West Papuan uh, campaigner Benny Wender, uh, who's been blocked from coming to Parliament by the Speaker. Right. Hey, so are you details, aware? I'm sorry. Yeah, he's a West Papuan yeah. uh, sort of campaigner. Yeah. Uh, the Greens wanted him to speak out here in the foyer. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, the Speaker has blocked him. Do you know why? You'd have to ask them. It's probably about the way that we um, perceive Indonesian rights and how we treat Indonesia and under what um, terms he's coming, but you need to ask the Speaker. Because he's, he's, met, he's been in parliaments in other parts of the world, etc., etc., UN, <coughs> British Parliament. He's even met um, David Cameron. What's the. What, what I honestly don't have any details. It hasn't been raised with me, so you need to go to the State of Carter. What is the government's stance on this? Well, we, we believe um, in Indonesia's, uh, totality of Indonesia's uh, rights and their recognition of their territory in that area. Would your government support a living wage? Well, what companies uh, or council organisations uh, choose to do in terms of paying their staff is a matter for them. So the only area where the government plays a role is in the setting of the minimum wage. And if you're asking me whether we intend to raise the minimum wage to $18 now, then the answer is no, not in the next 12 months. And I think there's always got to be a balance there between, um, obviously, um, you know, people's need to pay their bills and, and meet their liabilities, but, but the counter of that, of course, is make sure they remain on and that's the balancing act we're constantly trying to, to manage. But if you think about what's been happening in the economy at the moment, labour markets haven't been that strong. Um, you've got a situation of inflation that's low, running at about 0.8%. Uh, so, you know, I think in the end, companies, if they can pay more, you know, obviously you encourage them to pay more, but, but I'm not sure it's as quickly. It's as simple as saying this is a magical number on all meter. Would you endorse a campaign though to set voluntary levels to encourage those companies to, to get up to that level of that? Well, I think it's very subjective, um, and so and it varies on circumstances. Like the minimum wage, I mean, some people on the minimum wage have it as a starting out point, and you know, it's a very important stepping stone to where they go. Um, for others, it's it's more their long term pay because of the nature of the job they're doing. So I don't think we'll be running the advocacy campaign up to employees what they choose to pay. On the um, Hobbit. It's clear that the um, students 
studios uh, sort of were saying or warning that they'd had second thoughts of um, some of those documents are released. How much of a worry is that to you? I'm not concerned by that. I don't think that's likely. You didn't feel that they have been um, essentially bullying the government into keeping the information secret for their own? No, I think the, the, the information that was contained in those statements was quite historic. Say it's wrong, I'm just saying they made those comments quite a long time ago. Uh, look, from the government's point of view, we are pretty comfortable, I've got to say, about releasing the information. Um, we've seen the determination from the uh, Ombudsman, uh, the Minister's been working with the other parties involved. We understand sensitivities that other parties sometimes have when it comes to commercial dealings with the government, um, but we think it's highly likely that uh, both certainly the government and all other parties will be complying with the rule from the Ombudsman. Well, is, that, is, that, is that why, though, the government is now looking at changing the Official Information Act to strengthen um, protections around commercial confidentiality and third parties? No, it's not specific to the, to the whole. That came out of the, I think, the Law Commission recommendations. I mean, look, the only thing I'd say is the, the government is sometimes in a position where it um, procures um, equipment or, or services. And those commercial negotiations are, you know, can be sensitive um, in, this, in the same way they are between companies and, and you know, the free market, if you like. So, you know, in that, that instance, when, when a company deals with the government, I think they are entitled to know if they do so on a commercially sensitive basis, that's, that remains confidential. Now, anyone who deals with the government also needs to understand that they were subject to the Official Information Act. And, and it just depends on you know where that sits. Sometimes the ombudsman agrees to withhold that. Sometimes they don't. Generally, they do. It's commission sensitive. What was the nature of that information? I think um, remember you said it wasn't commission sensitive. And other comments you made elsewhere. Is that right? Well, I don't think it is. I personally don't think it is hugely commission sensitive. If you are comfortable about releasing it now, why didn't you release it after the first request? Because we've been working with the other parties. It's but not really any big blunt. Haven't read it all and read it all again. I don't think there's anything in it that's going to embarrass the government, so or, or necessarily other parties' actions. So, so it was out of uh, respect for the other parties that, that yeah. you held back. Plain packaging um, on tobacco. I understand that's been it's gone back to cabinet. Where yes. where are you at with the decision on that? Uh, look, the paper has to come back to cabinet. It was due to come back last week, and Tariana couldn't make the cabinet meeting. And so um, when she has an opportunity to be at Cabinet, then we'll discuss the next steps for her, but it makes sense. Yeah, this could be the offending drought in the Northland. Does the government have any advice about whether or not perhaps support should be offered? On the drought? Yes. Uh, look, um, Nathan Guy may, may have had that advice in terms of the Minister of Water Primary Industries. I haven't received any advice on that yet. Do Cabinet consider the 4G spectrum allocation and compensation provided to it? Uh, look, I had a, a very brief discussion, but there was no paper.